Welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome to today's show of the Law of Self Defense. I am, of course, Attorney Andrew Branca. Thank you, thank you so much for Law of Self Defense. And today we are gathered to talk about a very disturbing shooting that took place last month in North Carolina. The shooting of Jason Harley Klopfer. Uh, I'm going to call him Harley on his Facebook page. I know the the in the video we'll see the police refer to him as Jason, um, but uh, on his own Facebook page he writes his name out as J Harley Klopfer. So, uh, and I I've seen photos of him wearing a Harley like leather motorcycle uh, vest. So perhaps he prefers to go by Harley. I'm going to presume that to be the case. So Harley Harley Klopfer was uh, awakened by police about 5 a.m from a good night's sleep with his, uh, I presume, significant other, the woman he was in bed with, also sleeping. Um, they were awakened by police, responded to his house, um, demanded he come to the door, show his hands. He did all that, and they shot him. Uh, these were heavily armed police. It was a SWAT team. They had long guns. Uh, he is damn lucky to be alive. Harley Klopfer, the, the woman, too. Allie, I believe her name is. I have it here someplace. Um, very, very lucky to be alive. And uh, the manner in which the police are explaining the shooting or failing to explain the shooting uh, ranges from a really contemptible uh, at worst to an utter lack of transparency at best uh, and uh, a real risk for serious criminal charges for these officers. This appears to me to be a shooting that would be extreme, extremely uh, difficult to justify. So, it gets a little technical because it's an, it's an unusual set of facts. Uh, frankly, it's made somewhat more complicated by the fact that uh, Klepfer survived. The legal analysis would actually be a bit more straightforward if he were dead because certain, um, certain legal concepts would apply if he were dead that, that don't apply because he's alive. Curious enough, uh, we'll be going through all that, but first I think we need to step through the video. Um, so, before I dive into all those details, I want to remind everybody, if at any time you'd like to ask questions during the show, uh, let's see, we are streaming. Looks like we're streaming. Are we streaming everywhere we need to be? Let me refresh that little page. It looks like we are. Uh, and last, Rumble. Okay, uh, so if you'd like to pose a question, it needs to be in two places, one of two places. Uh, one is on our Law Self-Defense Members dashboard in the chat. Law Self-Defense Members get to ask all their questions for free, for free, uh, and being a Law Self-Defense Member is pretty easy, folks. Just go to lawofselfdefense.com slash join. It's less than $10 a month, about 30 cents a day to be a Law Self-Defense Member. You get access to all our members-only content, video, blog posts, podcasts, um, and uh, for 30 cents a day, and you get to ask all the questions you want, and I'll answer them at no additional cost, uh, of course, than uh, the less than 10 bucks to be a member. You can join right now, lawselfdefense.com slash join. If you do pose a question in the member chat, please preface the question with the word question in all capitals, so it's easy for me to spot. Or if you're watching this live on YouTube, you can pose your question as a super chat, but it needs to be a minimum of $5 to get your question answered by me. Uh, so frankly, of those two ways, it's a lot less costly to be a uh, law self defense member, get all the questions you want answered in the course of any month for less than 10 bucks or pay minimum five bucks a question on YouTube Super Chat, but I leave that all up to your discretion. Also, the sponsor of today's content is none other than, than Law Self-Defense itself, specifically our upcoming Law Self-Defense Advanced Course. This is our full-day self-defense law course taught by me live over Zoom. We teach this class month, once, maybe twice a year. We only have this one date scheduled for 2023. 
Saturday, April 15th, our full day course. We cover in plain English all the required elements of a claim of self-defense, what needs to happen, where the little boundaries are for lawful self-defense. We talk about what makes someone an attractive target for prosecution, so things not to do, common mistakes not to make that get people in a lot of trouble. We talk about uh, defense of yourself, defense of family, friends, colleagues, strangers, active shooter events, defense of highly defensible property like your home, business, occupied vehicle, defense of personal property. We talk about interacting with the police in the aftermath of a use of force event. It's a lot more subtle and complicated than you might think. We spend about an hour doing just that. We talk about how you can develop your own personalized, legally sound self-defense strategy and a great deal more. And it is live and I stay on as long as people have questions. Um, so you walk away with every question you could possibly have answered. And it is applicable to all 50 states, so it doesn't matter what state you live in. The great news is, although we only teach it once or twice a year, this one is Saturday, April 15th. If you sign up for this class this month, so you have, what, a, about a week left, this month you get 50% off the normal registration. Save yourself $100. If you sign up for this April 15th class next month in February, it's only 25% off. In March, it's only 10% off. In April, it's full price. So, better to sign up sooner rather than later. I would encourage you to sign up right away. You can learn more about this course and sign up if you wish at lawofselfdefense.com slash advanced. Okay, so the facts of this case are that Harley Kopfler on December 13th, 2022, so about five weeks ago, uh, and his uh, presumably significant other, Allie, were in bed as prudent people ought to be at 5 a.m. in the morning, unless they have a good reason not to be, when the police came to his residence. Uh, so the police would later that day release a uh, an interesting statement. Um, they would describe this as on Monday, December 12th, 2022, at approximately 11 p.m., Cherokee County 911 Communications received a 911 call indicating a disturbance with several gunshots fired at the residence of Harley Kopfler. Deputies were immediately dispatched and arrived on the scene at approximately 11.17 approximately p.m. Deputies attempted to make contact with the alleged shooter, but were unsuccessful, recognizing there was an armed suspect present. I mean, I don't think they even knew that, right? At this point, just a report of one. Um, and the potential for a hostage situation, Cherokee County Sheriff's Office obtained a search warrant and requested assistance from the Cherokee Indian Police Department SWAT team. And uh, so this is a different department. The Cherokee Indian Police Department SWAT team is different than the Cherokee County Sheriff's Office, which was in charge of this call. Uh, apparently, as we'll learn, the Cherokee County Sheriff's Office doesn't have a SWAT team. They weren't given money for a SWAT team, so they don't have their own SWAT team. When they feel they need a SWAT team, they request the assistance of the Cherokee County, uh, far, sorry, the Cherokee Indian Police Department SWAT team. So Cherokee County Sheriff's respond to this 911 call. No one's answering the door. They decide to get a warrant and call out their friends, the Cherokee Indian Police SWAT team to assist them. And it's the SWAT team, the Cherokee Indian Police Department SWAT team that would ultimately shoot uh, Harley Kopfler. But presumably, the Cherokee County Sheriff's Office was in charge of this call. Uh, they're the ones releasing press statements about it. So, uh, and the, the, the shots were fired just before, right around 5 a.m. So quite a lot of time passed, folks, from the, from the 11 p.m. the night before, December 12th, to 5 a.m. the following morning on December 13th, which makes one wonder if there was really a suspected hostage situation or violence in progress what did they observe for those six hours from 11 p.m. the night before to 5 a.m. when the shooting happened? Because it appears that nothing was going on because it appears Harley Kopfler and Ali were asleep in bed. So remember, everything in use of force, folks, requires reasonableness. Reasonableness is not speculation or imagination. It's the application of your powers of reason to evidence that you're observing. And so if the police are making decisions here, one has to wonder uh, what evidence were they basing their decisions on? Now, initially, the initial evidence, of course, is the 911 call and the police are 
required, expected to take a 911 call of this type seriously. And they responded within a few minutes, pretty quick response time. Uh, but what happened between 1117 and 5 a.m., almost six and hours, five and a half hours, that, that was consistent with the perception that this was an uh, imminent violent action taking place that they needed to intervene in. There's no shouts from inside the trailer. There's no gunshots happening. It's hard to get to reasonableness here when all that time has passed. Presumably the home's been under observation the entire time and nothing's happening. No lights, no noise, no shouts, no gunshots. Rather, rather a bizarre set of circumstances. Now, one thing I will say, of course, is there's things we don't know because the officers involved aren't saying anything. Their departments aren't saying anything, or at least they're not saying anything useful. Uh, and much of what they are saying appears to be blatantly untruthful. But that is circumstantial evidence that I would suggest is consistent with misconduct here. I would expect more transparency from a police department that shot a man under highly questionable circumstances than what we're getting here. And what we're getting here from the police are either lies or deflections. That's not good. This is very, very different than the Aaron, Aaron Dean case, the shooting of Tatiana Jefferson for, for reasons we'll go into. Uh, but that's where we are. We're at 5 a.m. on the morning of December 13th, 2022. And uh, we, have, uh, we have video of what happened inside the trailer uh, because the... Um, Harley Coppler had a little security camera of some type inside his trailer. Now, I will note that uh, this video from the camera inside the trailer was not released until just a couple days ago, January 18th, 2023. And uh, it was released by Harley Coppler. The police say they never saw this video in until that day. Now, Harley released it on his uh, Facebook page. That's the video we're going to look at. He, he built a little like video presentation that includes this video. Uh, I'll share the entirety of that little uh, Facebook uh, stream with you. Uh, it includes the five minutes or so of the, the uh, surveillance video camera footage from inside the trailer. I haven't seen any other video and there, there ought to be quite a bit. Uh, for one thing, the, the police had used a little throwable robot they tossed into Harley's uh, trailer home. So there should be video from that. There should be lots of body camera video. Uh, lots of cops were apparently there. We see at least four, five, six of them in passing. Uh, very likely there were even more outside. So there, there should be lots of video footage and we haven't seen it yet. And I would expect the department that wanted to act in a transparent manner six weeks after this tragic shooting, pointless shooting, um, would have released all that to, to explain what happened. Even if they were wrong to explain what happened. But they haven't, at least not to my knowledge. And I looked again this morning and haven't seen it. So let's uh, let let me open up. Let me open up Harley Klopfer's his little Facebook video here. So this is prepared for him. This is you know his property. This is a, a fair use. Presumably he put it on Facebook because uh, he wanted all of us see it uh, let's see um presumably he wants it shared especially if it's being shared in a favorable way but i want to make clear i didn't prepare this this is uh, harley klopfer's uh content as he posted it on his facebook page a little presentation uh i did uh, augment the audio uh so it'll hopefully it'll sound a bit better uh in this version where I've optimized the audio than in uh, Harley Klopford's own version. Uh, but I'm just going to roll it through. It's about six and a half minutes from when I start. Uh, and then we'll we'll start digging through the uh, the legal analysis. Here we go. Folks, don't put in a $3 super chat. <laughs> I just said the super chats have to be $5. So $3 is, is just... Or, or put it in the law of self-defense uh, questions. Actually, before I roll the video, let me see if there's any questions that have already come in that I should answer now uh, from the law of self-defense members. No, not quite yet. Um, and from the super chats. Just the $3 one. 
Okay, so let's go ahead. I'll share this screen. And here is that Harley Klopfer video. Oh yeah, obviously it should go without saying this today's show will be promptly demonetized by uh, YouTube uh, the moment I, I play this video because you do see um, Harley Klopfer shot and fall to the ground and scream in pain. And uh, there's there's not a lot of blood and gore type stuff, uh, but uh, <laughs> all right. And an extra two bucks came in uh, from Floodland99 on a super chat. Okay, buddy, that's, that's cool. Thank you. Um, but uh, there is a man shot here. Uh, he does survive. He's, he's not killed miraculously. Uh, presumably, he was shot with long guns with AR rifles. It's uh, he's a he's a lucky dude, man. Uh, and uh, there are photos also of his uh, post-surgical um, stitches and stuff. So if that makes you queasy, then uh, you know maybe this isn't the show for you today. Uh, again, it's not particularly gory, but there's lots of stitches, lots of stitching. I mean, they went deep into this guy. Uh, to fix the damage these rounds caused. So with that warning, done. Uh, so the uh, the super chat that came in so far from Floodland99, uh, total of $5. Thank you very much. He asks, can the police throw a uh, robots into your home? Um, it, de it depends if, you know, are there exigent circumstances? Here they're claiming that they were concerned, uh, they had reason to be concerned about a hostage situation. Um, you know, is that a reasonable response? Could they look in your windows? Um, yeah, I would think so. Um, they have a search warrant, they say, uh, and a search warrant presumably would permit them to enter the home. If they're allowed to enter the home, they're allowed to throw a robot into the home. So yeah, I expect under, under the facts of this case, the, the robot tossing in the robot was permissible. Uh, I don't know if Harley leaves his doors open when he goes to sleep, because it doesn't look like the cops jimmy the door open. It looks like it's unlocked and just open a door and toss the robot in. Uh, but there you go. Okay, so here's that video. Just setting up the facts of the case, just before 5 a.m., the SWAT officers tossed a robot equipped with cameras into the residence and awoke the camera. They're talking out there. They open the door. And they threw in this little robot. So the robot's on the floor. So the robot is uh, kind of like a cylinder with a wheel on each side, a little tail to keep it you know, oriented correctly with the, the camera. And it's got a flashlight. It's got a light built into it, a single little headlight. Uh, and that's what you're seeing now on the floor. You'll. It's hard to see the robot per se, but you can kind of make out on the ground how it's, it's rolling around a little bit. It's pointing its light and presumably its camera in different directions. That doorway in the back is a doorway into the bedroom. That's where Klopfer and uh, his uh, uh, Ali are uh, asleep in bed. We'll see the uh, robot orient itself so it can see into the doorway, shining the light into the doorway. Uh, in just a moment. But the, the action right now is on the floor here near the bottom of the screen. That's where the robot will be moving around. And presumably the robot's camera image is being broadcast out to the officers outside. Otherwise, what would be the point? There's the robot moving around, swiveling. So now it's moving up to the doorway, shining its light through the doorway into the bedroom. And they're waking up inside. So, so what are they seeing here? They're seeing just there's like a light on the floor of their trailer shining into their bedroom. And they're just, it's waking them up. That would be pretty disorienting. 
doing? Oh, hello. By the way, right here, it looks to me. Oh, this is not letting me. Um, it's not letting me zoom in. When I'm not sharing the screen, I can zoom in. Let's see if I can pull up a zoomed up image here. It appears to me that Harley has a pistol in his hand right here. It's hard to make out. It's actually a little e easier to see when it's a, in motion than when it's a still photo. Uh, but it looks to me like he's a pistol. Not that there's anything wrong with him having a pistol in his hand. Uh, but it occurs to me that uh, the robot might be seeing the pistol. So there may be an officer outside who's telling others he's got a gun in his hand, um, which would affect the mental state of the officers outside. Right now, they would have reason to believe there's a gun present. Whoa! What is going on? So uh, I don't know why there's those little black spots in the video. That's in the original, folks. That's not introduced by me. Uh, but now the police are calling out to him. Jason, he can hear his name. The police will order them up to the door to come out the door with their hands up, and they're, they're proceeding to do that. Uh, Harley, uh, Jason, will pick up the robot in his hand, his right hand, uh, and carry it to the door with him. Uh, he also has a cigarette in his left hand. Jason. The fuck is that fucking I don't know. There's cursing too. Of course. What's Come outside, Jason. Step outside the door onto the deck and go with your hand. So he's picked up the robot. What is going on? What the fuck? Jason, we just want to talk to you. Come outside. Oh, yeah. What? Okay, so that's uh, that's the shooting that happens. Then there's there's a few more minutes of uh, him saying, "I've been shot." The police keep giving them orders to come out with their hands up. Of course, it's not really possible for them to do that. Uh, Ali eventually does. Um, he has to kind of crawl his way out the door with his hands out the door. It's it's kind of a crazy scene. Uh, the cops come in. They do a sweep, and. Uh, um, for others, they call out, if anybody's here, show yourself, that kind of thing. But th there isn't anybody else in, in, in the house. Uh, and then at some point at the end, the cops, three cops come in. Uh, and uh, basically, one of them urges the other two to uh, stop talking because cameras. Uh, I don't know if they spotted this camera inside the home or they're just concerned about saying something stupid on their body cameras. Uh, again, it doesn't look, uh, doesn't look particularly good uh, for the police. So... Uh, Koffler's, Koffler's been shot here. So let's go back. Let me open up this statement here from the county sheriff's office that they released later that day. Share that with you. Let's see. That's uh, the more recent one. Where's the previous one? The December 13th statement. Let's see if I can make this bigger. So I already read a uh, part of this on Monday, December 12th, 2022 at approximately 11 p.m. Cherokee County 911 received a call indicating a disturbance with several gunshots fired at uh, Harley Koffler's home. Uh, Cherokee County deputies dispatched arrived in the scene 1117. Deputies attempted to make contact with the alleged shooter, but were unsuccessful, uh, recognizing there was an armed suspect present. I mean, they don't know that recognizing that there was an armed suspect present. I mean, all they have is a report from 911 of gunshots. I don't know. I'm not familiar with this area of North, North Carolina, folks, but there's lots of North Carolina where people just shoot. Uh, but in any case, they say that uh, recognizing there was an armed suspect present and the potential for a hostage situation, Cherokee County Sheriff's Office obtained a search warrant and requested assistance from the Cherokee Indian Police Department SWAT team. Now things get really interesting. Um, the press release then says, 
the suspected shooter engaged in a verbal altercation with officers and emerged from a camper trailer and confronted the officers. Okay. Let's go back here. You see a verbal confrontation here? He literally doesn't say a word. He literally says nothing. It's only the police that are uh, making any kind of statements. Uh, but here it says the suspected, suspected shooter engaged in a verbal altercation with officers and emerged from a camper trailer and confronted officers. No, he's responding to their commands. He's not confronting anybody. He's not engaged in a verbal altercation. So that's, that's a, a flat out lie. Uh, members of the Cherokee Indian police SWAT team, so not the Cherokee County Sheriff's Department, the Sheriff's Department wants to make clear, that clear at least, uh, members of the Cherokee Indian police SWAT team fired upon the suspect and wounded him. The suspect was transported to uh, Erlanger in that, I guess that's the hospital where he's last reported in stable condition. The North Carolina State Bureau of Investigations was called to investigate the matter. After consultation with the district attorney's office, Klopfer has been charged with communicating threats and resist, obstruct, and delay. Uh, the matter remains under investigation and more charges may follow. What were the threats communicated? In what way did he resist, obstruct, and delay? This is basically a resisting arrest charge under North Carolina law. By the way, they, they say it wrong. The actual North Carolina statute reads resist, delay, obstruct. So <laughs> they don't even write it out wrong. Um, but there's zero evidence for any of this. So wh what kind of investigation was done here? by the North Carolina Bureau of Investigations. Presumably they talked to the officers on the scene, the sheriff's office and the Cherokee Indian Police Department SWAT team. And they're relying on their conclusions based on what those officers said. Who told them that any of this happened? And based on what? Where exactly are the lies coming from here? Because this is clearly a lie. And that looks awfully bad, folks. Now, this is a completely different situation, of course, than the Aaron Dean case. Aaron Dean was sent to investigate a suspected burglary in progress, was doing a surveillance at the outside of uh, the structure. He was sent to peer through a window, and the other side of the window, he saw a silhouette raising a gun at him. And he shot and killed a Tatiana Jefferson. She was a resident of the home. She was probably thinking there was a prowler outside. Uh, so it was a, an awful shooting. Everybody wishes it hadn't happened. Tatiana, Tatiana Jefferson was killed. Uh, everybody wishes she was still alive. But in that case, Aaron Dean had genuine reason to believe he was facing a deadly force threat. He saw a gun being pointed at him. He testified, or he said. Um, and, uh, and there was, in fact, a gun present. So... Uh, that's an understandable set of circumstances in which an officer might reasonably use deadly force and self-defense. Here we have none of that. Now, of course, it is true that uh, Harley Klopfer has objects in his hand. Uh, he's got the robot in one hand with a light on it. He has a cigarette in the other hand. Uh, is it possible there are officers outside who had were observing the robot? The robot had seen Harley with a handgun in bed when he was startled, first awoke, uh, told other officers he's got a gun in there. And when he came to the door, somebody thought they saw him with a gun. There were a lot of lights on him from the officers. Could that have been a reasonable perception that he had a gun in his hand? Could it have been an unreasonable perception? Because unreasonable perceptions are, are not enough to justify a use of force in this context. And, and even if that were all true, even if the officers involved wanted to claim, hey, we, we were mistaken in believing he was a threat, but we had a reasonable basis to believe he was a threat and a reasonable basis would be sufficient to justify the use of deadly force. Uh, even if they wanted to make that argument or at worst, hey, we had a belief, it was genuine, it was held in good faith that he was presenting as a deadly force threat even if it was unreasonable, we had that belief. Um, 
even if they wanted to make that argument, uh, they can completely destroy their credibility with the, these false representations of what happened and these ridiculous, unfounded criminal charges They're, they brought against the man they shot. And there's no evidence to support any of this. Plus the six hour gap between the 911 call and when this action actually happened, nothing's going on in the house for six hours. Presumably the house is under observation. There's no shouts, no gunshots, no cries for help, no screams of anguish, no argument happening. They're asleep in bed. So very difficult to see how there can be any reasonable or even unreasonable perception of the need to use deadly force in this situation. Uh, so that's where things stand until, and of course, until... On January 18th, we don't have this video. So all we have is the press release from the Cherokee County Sheriff's Department. Take the police and what they say at face value. For all we know, it's true. And then on January 18th, Harley Klopfer releases this video. And we can see that the press release is nothing but other utter, utter lies. Uh, and two days later, the Sheriff's Department releases another press release on their Facebook page. Let me pull that one up. This is from, uh, what, four days ago now, the 20th, so last Friday. What's this one say? Uh, this one says, this is two days after Harley Klopfer has released the video we just watched. Um, on the evening of December 12th, 2022, emergency 911 dispatch received a report about a possible shooting and hostage situation. Uh, do we even know where this call came from? Because it clearly didn't come from Harley. Didn't come from Allie. Was this a SWAT attempt? It would be nice to know these things. By the way, if it was a SWAT attempt, it's clearly it would be appropriate to be charged as attempted murder by whoever made this call in the absence of good reason to believe that this is what was happening. Uh, since the Cherokee County Sheriff's Office does not have a tactical team to handle a hostage event, I requested assistance from the Cherokee Indian Police Department SWAT team. So not us, the sheriff wants you to know. Subsequently, members of the Cherokee Indian Police Department SWAT team fired shots at an individual who emerged from the home, injuring him. Yeah, a lot of injury. Following the shooting, my office issued a press release about the event. That's the one I just read to you from December uh, 13th, where they they claim there was a verbal um, attack, a, con a confrontation by Harley Klopfer as he stood in his doorway saying nothing with his hands in the air uh, and, uh, and describing these obstruction charges and communicating threats charges that they've brought against the man they shot. Um, following the shooting, my office issued a press release about this event. The release was prepared by the county attorney. So not me. I didn't prepare it. Uh, based on information my office received from the Cherokee Indian Police Department. Well, did he have information from his own officers, his own deputies? Because they were there too, right? Surely. So did the, is, is he saying, the Cherokee Indian Police Department, they lied to him and that's why these charges, that's why that false description of the events? So who's holding them accountable? Who fired these shots? Was it one officer or was it one of these sympathetic firing situations where one officer starts and the other officers all have their guns pointed, they start shooting too. By the way, if all these shots are, are from long guns, um, obviously all those long guns, those five, five, six rounds didn't hit Harley Klopfer because he's alive. Did they all miss with long guns? At, at what were probably pretty darn short distances? I mean, it's a miracle Alley wasn't shot in this fusillade of fire for no apparently very good reason. Certainly they're not providing a good reason. They don't even provide a reasonable explanation for shooting in this updated press release. Neither myself nor Chief Deputy Justin Jacobs, this is from the, this is the sheriff writing. His name is what? Dustin Smith. Neither myself nor Chief Deputy Justin Jacobs were on the scene at the time of the shooting. So we relied on information provided to us from the Cherokee Indian Police Department. My goal with issuing that press release came from his office is full of lies, but it's other people's fault, uh, was not to comment on the subsequent criminal investigation, which remains ongoing, but rather to update the public on a dangerous situation. Uh, well, it wasn't a dangerous situation when you released that press release. It was over. 
Klopfer was in the hospital shot. So there was no dangerous situation in progress. The public, if you were going to update them, they might have liked to have been updated on why you shot that guy. That would have been helpful. You're still not telling us why you shot him. I mean, you told us in the prior press release, but that was lies. So what's the reason now for why he was shot? The sheriff, Dustin Smith, continues, the first time I ever saw video footage from the shooting was on January 18th, 2023. Presumably, that's the Facebook video we just watched that Klopfer himself put on his Facebook page. It's my understanding that the state and district attorney's office has been notified of the video as well. Well, one would hope so. When I campaigned for the office of sheriff, I had several conversations with fellow law enforcement officials and the public about the need for Cherokee County to have its own tactical team. It is imperative for us to be self-reliant when it comes to fighting crime, especially during a situation in which time is of the es essence, such as a hostage or active shooter event. I will be asking county commissioners for the funds to create such a unit when budget negotiations for the next fiscal year begin. So not only are we not provided with an explanation for why this guy was shot, a truthful, evidence-supported explanation, we get whining from the sheriff that he didn't get adequate funding to have his own little SWAT team. This is a conversation you have offline with the people who would provide you with funding. This is not an excuse for why this guy was shot. Thank you for your understanding and continued support. Folks, if I lived in that county, I'd, I'd be electing a different sheriff the next time around. Uh, not only is this a terrible event, uh, but this... Uh, Handling of the event after the fact is contemptible. Uh, this sheriff should be explaining what went wrong here and what steps he's going to take to make sure it never happens again and who's going to be held accountable. He's doing none of that. This is not uh, command ownership of a bad event, which is what you should expect from your county sheriff. It's, uh, it's, it's just terrible. All right, so what's the crime here? Um, I mean... Miraculously, Klopfer is alive. But what if he died? What if they'd killed him? What would be the appropriate charge here? Criminal charge. What would be the legal defenses here? Uh, frankly, folks, the appropriate criminal charge would be murder if Klopfer was dead. Second degree murder under uh, North Carolina law. First degree murder is an aggravated form of murder, like kidnapping and stuff like that. That's a, a capital offense murder, Norm, normal murder, just intentional, unlawful killing of another person, uh, absent the special conditions that would uh, mitigate it to manslaughter is just a second degree murder. That's good for, here comes the train. He loves that horn, that conductor. Uh, good for uh, 12, 12 years to life in prison. Second degree murder under um, under North Carolina law. And what might be the defenses here? Uh, well, of course, the first defense we might consider might be self-defense, that the responding officers had a reasonable belief that Klopfer was presenting as an imminent deadly force threat. I don't see it. He's not being confrontational. He's not being non-compliant. He's being completely compliant. His hands are up. He does have objects in his hands. Folks, I would discourage you from doing that. Um, Nothing good is likely to happen from you having objects in your hands, uh, especially under these circumstances. But, but with all the lights that were on him, could a reasonable officer, he wasn't pointing the robot at them, right? That would be a different set of circumstances. Hands are up. I, I just don't see the reasonableness argument for an officer saying, hey, even if I was wrong about him presenting as a deadly force threat, I had reason to believe it was true. Evidence from which I can make a reasonable inference that he was an eminent deadly force threat. I just don't see it. So I don't see self-defense in the perfect sense, perfect self-defense applicable here. And that would be the only thing that could lead to an acquittal of the officer who shot this guy, at least the first one who fired. You may make arguments for the, if other, if there was a sympathetic firing situation that other officers were relying on the perception of the first guy who shot that's not a bad argument to make but someone fired first who's that guy what's his justification because i don't see self-defense here now you might argue that the officer had a genuine good faith belief that uh Klopfer was presenting as a deadly force threat but that belief was unreasonable 
That's what we call imperfect self-defense. And it, it can't lead to an acquittal. It can only mitigate what would have been a murder conviction down to a manslaughter conviction. Um, that's possible here. Um, North Carolina does recognize the doctrine of imperfect self-defense. Generally, it applies when someone uses... The North Carolina flavor of imperfect self-defense is a little different than the national norm and, and actually may not have application here. So normally what happens in imperfect self-defense is you have these elements of self-defense. If they were perfect, you'd have perfect self-defense, you'd have an acquittal. But if the perception of any of these were unreasonable, you'd have imperfect self-defense, mitigates murder down to manslaughter. But... North Carolina defines its imperfect self-defense a little bit different. Let me see if I can, I pulled up a decision here that talks about it. So this is, uh, this is from Lexis, the decision of state v. Broussard from uh, the North Carolina Court of Appeals, uh, 2015. But it's, I just poked, the definition is the same everywhere. Um, and it, it cites a uh, Supreme Court, North Carolina Supreme Court decision, quotes it. There are two types of self-defense, perfect and imperfect. Perfect self-defense excuses a killing altogether, while imperfect self-defense may reduce a charge of murder to voluntary manslaughter. For a defendant to be entitled to an instruction on either perfect or imperfect self-defense, the evidence must show that the defendant believed it to be necessary to kill his adversary in order to save himself from death or great bodily harm. In addition, defendant's belief must be reasonable in the circumstances as they appeared to him at the time uh, were sufficient to create such a belief in the mind of a person of ordinary fitness. So North Carolina imperfect self-defense actually requires reasonableness. Normally, it's the absence of reasonableness that qualifies as imperfect self-defense. So what triggers imperfect self-defense under North Carolina law? Uh, well, a defendant cannot benefit from perfect self-defense and can only claim imperfect self-defense if he was the aggressor or used excessive force. I guess you could argue the firing officer, the officer who fired the shots was an unlawful aggressor. He didn't have justification for firing the shots. So perhaps he could qualify under imperfect self-defense, but that would only get him to manslaughter. In any case, of course, uh, Klopfer didn't die. So this wouldn't be a killing charge case. This would be some form of what I would call a battery, but North Carolina is a little sloppy in its legal terminology. It uses the term assault uh, to kind of mean both assault, putting someone in fear of harm and battery, the actual touching, the actual harm. Uh, but under North Carolina law, imperfect self-defense is not, not a defense to assault, as we see in this other North Carolina appellate court decision, State v. Battle from 2017, imperfect self-defense by contrast is not a defense to assault. So it can't play a role here because this is not a killing case. This would be an assault case. And we'd be looking at some flavor of assault. So North Carolina has this in uh, different degrees that might be applied here. So um, Harley Klopfer is reported to be uh, disabled and North Carolina has a specific assault statute for disabled people. Assault on individuals with a disability. Uh, and it makes it, uh, where's the uh, penalty here? Any person who commits any aggravated assault or assault and battery on an individual with a disability is guilty of a class F felony. Well, that looks like, you know, if Klopfer is was disabled at the time in the assault. The question would be whether the officers knew he was disabled. That would be part of the intent required for that statute. Class of felony, good for 10 to 41 months. But even if the officers didn't know he was disabled, we have another assault statute here. Um, any person who assaults another person and inflicts serious bodily injury is guilty of a class F felony. Well, clearly they inflicted serious bodily injury. They shot him. And I haven't shown you the, sur the post-surgical photos, but I mean, he's opened up basically from sternum all the way below his belly button. Obviously, serious uh, bodily injury, still a class F felony, 10 to 41 months. Uh, that looks to me to be the charge here. Imperfect self-defense is not a legal defense to assault, as we just saw. Perfect self-defense doesn't seem to have application here. So there doesn't seem to be really any reasonable alternative but conviction for this uh, serious bodily injury assault 
class F felony, good for 10 to 41 months in prison is what I expect the criminal outcome should be. Again, at least for the first officer who fired. Uh, you can make different arguments for sympathetic firing after the first offer, officer fires. And they're just damn lucky that he's not dead. Or they'd be looking at, of course, substantially more serious charges. Now, let me see if I still have the, I should still have the video up here. I do. So he's shot, he's crawling to the door. Cops come in, they search. Look, they all got long guns. Well, these guys have handguns out, but the first guy has a long gun. Next guy has a, you know, they're all geared up, handgun. They don't find anybody. They go back out. He's getting treatment now. Uh, and then we have these cops come in. Right here, behind us. That's not the scene I wanted. Let's see. Uh, I think it's these guys here. Three cops enter. They can do a second or two. Fuck. Bro, fuck. Hey, camera, camera. Cameras, cameras. So one of them's reminding the other two that they could be on camera. I, I don't know if they see this surveillance camera. I, I suspect they don't. They don't appear to ever look directly at it. Uh, they may just be talking about their body cameras, and they, they don't want stupid stuff caught on their body cameras. But it's not a good look, folks. What do they have to hide? Uh, I mean, in a sense, of course... We've all seen wrongful prosecutions and convictions of police officers. So uh, I guess in that sense, it's understandable. But in the broader context here of the other lies that have been released by the sheriff's department, um, they say at the initiation of the SWAT team guys, I mean, they imply in their press release, that the sheriff's department implies in its press release that they were misled uh, by the Cherokee Indian police department SWAT members describing what happened. Uh, it just uh, it just looks absolutely awful. Uh, any of these things standing alone might have a harmless explanation, but the cu the accumulative effect of these kinds of statements, of the the outright lies in the first press release, of the failure still of the later press release a few days ago to explain with transparency what happened here, um, it's just awful, absolutely terrible. And just thank God that Klopfer what wasn't killed in this exchange. Okay, so I guess I guess this will be my video where I, I don't support the police, right, folks? For all those, uh, for all the, uh, the, the people who constantly yell bootlicker and uh, similar nice things. Uh, so let me go through the Law of Self-Defense member chat to see what questions I need to address there. Yeah, I don't think they. I don't think the uh, the police here saw the camera inside the home. I think they were worried about their body cameras. Uh, at, at the very least, if they saw the camera, I think they would have seen the footage earlier. Um, and I, I think I don't think they knew the video existed, or the, I don't think they would have tried to get away with these lies. Yeah, I can't believe he's alive. You have multiple people pointing long guns at you, a fusillade of fire from AR platform rifles and you're alive. It's, he's a lucky guy. Um, uh, slip, uh, law self-defense member Slippery Jim asks, question, legal vulnerability of the shots into the house after he falls down. Well, I mean, there is a delayed reaction effect that takes place, right? I'd have to, uh, I, I don't know. Are there still shots after he falls down? Let me let me rewind it here. We'll take a look again. So he's just about to open the door here. Let me make this a little bigger for everybody. There we go. Okay. 
Yeah, there's there are shots after after he's uh, falling back to the uh, floor of the trailer, but I I presume that would be a delayed response effect uh, by the sympathetically firing officers. Be nice to hear an explanation for that too, right? Uh, let's see. Back to the law of self-defense members. Oh, yes, uh, uh, with respect to uh, the woman, Allie, uh, she was not injured, so there wouldn't be an assault there. But reckless endangerment? Uh, yeah, that's a charge I'd look at hard here. Uh, District Attorney Ashley Hornsby has a Facebook page. Is that the local DA? I actually don't know. I should have looked. Sorry, folks. Um yeah, the, the press release doesn't say. I'll have to take a look. See if they have anything on it. Let me pull up that Facebook page real quick. Let's see if we can do anything useful. Ashley Hornsby Welch, District Attorney. Oh, she's got a press release about drunk driving. Press release about congratulating a judge. The office Christmas party, and that gets me to December 16th. So I don't see anything here on this uh, shooting. And it is uh, does include her district, does include Cherokee County. So uh, if she's saying anything about it, she's not saying it on her Facebook page. Uh, let's see. Uh, Law self-defense member Joe asks, the sheriff said the first time he saw any video of the event was January 18th. Why didn't he see any body cam video in the month preceding Harley's video? Bad investigation? I don't know. I'm, I'm presuming these officers had body cameras, but officers don't always have body cameras. So maybe there isn't any body camera footage. Uh, if there was any, um, I guess it's, it's unclear who was outside. I'm presuming sheriff's deputies were outside. I mean, they were the one who were handling this call. Um, so if they were there and they had body cameras, I would have expected him to have seen the, the footage. If they weren't there, if actual sheriff's deputies were not there or they didn't have body camera, then, then we're left with the Cherokee Indian Police Department. Uh, so it would have to be their body camera footage that he would have had to have had access. These are all great, great questions. We just don't have the answers to. I, I don't know why. Uh, Law self-defense member Joe says, so no press conference. Uh, I don't think he wants to answer questions. Which is terrible. Lack of transparency. Uh, law self-defense member Shane asks, what could the couple have done to defend themselves from death or great bodily injury? Not much. I mean, he could have not had the objects in his hand. I would have recommended that. I don't think that means he should have been shot. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but it's better to have your hands open and empty than have objects in them. Um, yeah. What are you going to do? Not be compliant with the police orders? Uh, it's a terrible situation. Uh, Law Self-Defense member Tax Pro Pam asks question, how much time elapsed before they took him out of the trailer for medical treatment? Uh, it's in that video. They, they start treating him to the extent that cops can. You know, I mean, um, I would guess they, I, I don't know what they did. I don't know what they did. Uh, and I'm, he, he certainly was hit in the body and he had an arm injury as well. Uh, you know, they could have thrown a tourniquet on the arm. Um, they're going to start putting stuffing combat gauze into him. I'm, I'm not sure what their trauma practices are, uh, but they they were there are calls while he's kind of just just while he's still outside the door, crawled outside the door, dragged outside the door, uh, where they uh, they're talking about you know getting him treatment right there, starting right there. Uh, how many times was he shot? I don't know. Uh, not too many because he lived once in the arm, at least once in the body. Um, but he lived, so couldn't have been shot too many times. Uh, Law Self-Defense member Tax Pro Pam says, this definitely makes me want to have cameras in my home now. I was against it before, but now I think differently. Yeah, I, I can tell you I have cameras all, all over my home for a variety of reasons. One is, uh, uh, 
you know, just as a deterrent. Uh, another is uh, if, uh, you know, bad stuff happens, it's nice to have a record of it. Uh, another is that, uh, you know, especially on the uh, external cameras, uh, I can view them in real time on my phone. So if I hear noise outside my front door, there, I actually have multiple cameras on the front door. So not just a doorbell camera, but also cameras that view the front door from different angles, including from behind anybody who would be at the front door. Uh, so I can get a pretty good idea of, of what's happening there or for any of the other cameras. And they're all accessible over my phone. Um, Law self-defense member George asks, question of rounds exited the trailer. Could other people claim reckless endangerment? Yeah, I mean, if the police would have reason to know there was other, other people there, if it's like a, you know, if this could be a trailer in the middle of a field, could be a trailer in the middle of a trailer park. I, I, I don't know what the surrounding area is like. Um, in fact, I, I thought I saw a map somewhere. <laughs> Was it in the, uh, I think it might've been in a news report. Let's see. Uh, I definitely had seen a map. Well, I can't find it right now. Um, it was like a cartoon map. Let me see if it was this news report. But to answer the question, yeah, if you know, if you're there and you can see that there's other residences around, um, and you can't articulate a justification for the firing and the shots, which appears to be the case here, uh, then reckless endangerment, you know, unjustified reckless endangerment of others is certainly a possible charge here. Let's see. All right, and now let me take a look at the super chats. That's all the member questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, uh, Dan, $5 Super Chat. Thank you very much. Says, question, Andrew, a North Carolina body cam video isn't public record and requires a court order to release it to the public. Police can allow family to see it. Um, I mean, I can understand, you know, why a body cam footage may not be public record I mean, I can imagine a state having that rule. So I'm not trying to contest that claim. Uh, but generally speaking, you, you would only need a court order to compel the release of the body cam footage. Uh, the department ought to be free to release it if they want to. And they should here. Or at, at least they should have viewed it and be making, you know, incorporating that insight into their press releases, which doesn't appear to be the case. We know there's not going to be anything on that body cam footage that uh, shows uh, Klepfer being confrontational or verbally threatening because that didn't happen. He literally didn't say a word from the moment he opened the door with his hands up. Jim Satala, $10 Super Chat, thank you very much, asks, was this an actual call from the home or swatting? It is obvious at the end when the officers blurred out that they are effed, there's cameras everywhere. Uh, I don't actually hear them say there's cameras everywhere. I hear them say cameras. Um, uh, uh, it's a, they know it's a bad shoot. These are Iraq war tactics. It, it looks like war tactics. I mean, I don't, I just, what really troubles me the most is they've had the house presumably under observation for six hours and there's no evidence consistent with the claims in the call. I mean, there's no evidence of a hostage situation. It's, it looks like a house where people are sleeping or not home at all. There's no noise, no fights, no arguments, no screams of anguish, no gunshots, no beating, no furniture breaking. Where's the evidence that would lead a reasonable person to believe they're dealing with a hostage situation? Or is just, you know, I've known, I've known some small department SWAT teams that were, they're not really SWAT teams. 
They're, they're just guys who want to dress up like SWAT. Is that what we're dealing here with here? They, they got all excited. They had a, a supposed hostage call. They could finally put all their gear on, point rifles at people. I don't know. It would be nice if somebody were asking these questions. Uh, where did the actual call come from? Another great question. The press release doesn't state. But it seems unlikely it came from this house because they were just sleeping. Could it have been a swatting? It could have been. In which case, that person should be charged with attempted murder. Fair Frozen 55, $5 super chat, thank you very much, asks, did they pretend the what the F word said while he was getting to the door was engaging in a confrontation with them? He wasn't even visible. Maybe. Maybe that's what's happening here. Maybe the uh, you know the robot has audio capability, so he's he's picked up the robot. He's saying what the f's going on inside his own trailer, and that's robots being monitored. The feed's being monitored by someone outside, and then when the someone outside, you know, sometimes you get a game of telephone here where one officer tells an officer something, and that officer repeats that hearsay to a third officer who repeats it to an investigator, and by the time it gets to the investigator, it comes out as well, he was being, you know, non-cooperative. He was saying, F you, what the F is going on? Um, so he was not being compliant. Even though that's not an accurate representation of what happened, that's how it gets communicated. It is important to keep in mind that especially when you have a group of officers, uh, especially people who hate cops generally, they tend to treat the group of officers as if they were, um, you know, all homogenous, all possessed the same perspective, had the same information, the same knowledge, uh, as every other officer, that it's like one mental entity that's all seeing. And that's not how it works. Um, officers, each individual officer has different information, has a different perspective, may see things differently, hear things differently, have a different recollection of what was going on. And for any individual officer, and if we're talking you know, criminal liability, you have to base their potential liability on them. Not what on other officers knew, but on what they knew or reasonably perceived or unreasonably perceived. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and to the extent that that kind of miscommunication happened, then it, it undermines any claim of reasonableness for the shots being fired, right? Uh, Thunder Chicken Gaming, $20 Super Chat, thank you very much, writes, based on the video and what you said about the timing and the obvious lies, these cops deserve long prison terms, and if they don't get that, we need to change any law we have to, so that they, that's the result for the next time. Uh, I think we have the laws we need. Um, so from a criminal liability perspective, obviously the greatest criminal liability is going to be for whoever fired the first shot. Um, and uh, and it's even possible they did that inadvertently. You know, they had they had a sloppy trigger finger. But the moment that first shot is fired, um, and then you get all the sympathetic firing from the other shots, we we have you have different arguments for each individual as to the extent of their criminal liability, uh, the uh, the fences they may raise. Uh, certainly, there's nothing but massive civil liability here. Because however you might excuse criminal liability for certain officers who who may have been relying on what they had reason to believe was the reasonable perception of a fellow officer. Uh, the department as a whole is responsible for all the officers and their conduct. So, yeah, I presume, uh, you know, if he doesn't have a, a, a lawyer yet, he's, he's got one now, now that this video has been released, I assure you. Uh, Roy Mata, uh, $2 super chat, dude, $2. You got to listen to the whole show, $5 minimum. Uh, the three beers, $5 super chat. Thank you very much. Who was the search warrant issued to? If the sheriff's office, why wasn't a sheriff officer there? Did PD even have authority to act on the warrant? Um, yeah, so the, the press release suggests the sheriff's office obtained a search warrant. I presume they were there. I can't imagine there were not deputies there. Uh, they're the ones who initially responded. They caught the call. They requested the warrant. They're getting assistance from the uh, Cherokee Indian Police Department SWAT team. But I presume the Cherokee County Sheriff's Department is still in charge of the call. Um, and they can ask other officers for help, um, you know, if they're there. 
Jim Satawa, uh, $10 super chat. Thank you again, Jim. Uh, they have a real problem because of the case law in North Carolina that says it's perfectly reasonable for someone to grab a weapon when startled awake by the police. They can't get qualified immunity for this. Um, well, qualified immunity would only apply in the context of civil liability, not criminal liability. My, my own focus is on the criminal law, not the civil law. Um, and of course, you, you don't need case law that it's, it's reasonable for a, a homeowner to grab a, we a weapon when they're startled awake by anybody. Um, that's, that's just a reasonable response to being startled awake in the middle of the night. Uh, Lawrence, $10 Canadian. Uh, hi, Andrew. Great stream. I'm a Canadian driving to the U.S. soon with an ATF permit to bring in a handgun. Oh, cool. I guess it depends on the state, but in some would I be allowed to carry concealed? Uh, Lawrence, I'm sorry. I don't do gun law, weapons law. I do use of force law. So when are you allowed to use a weapon? Not under what circumstances can you carry a weapon? What kind of license do you need? How would that apply to someone who's not an American citizen? Uh, I, I just, I don't know. That stuff varies tremendously from state to state, even within states. We have U.S. states that have like New York state, for example, has different gun laws for the state generally, for the greater New York City metro region, for the five boroughs of New York. Um, it, California has very different rules depending on what county you're in in California in terms of concealed carry. Uh, so it's just, there's no way for me to, I, I don't claim to have that level of expertise for all 50 states. Uh, so I really can't answer your question. Uh, let's see, JC Adult, $5 Super Chat asks, uh, Jason, oh, he says, Jason has an ongoing personal injury suit against Outback Steakhouse. I emailed support uh, the link. I'll, I'll take a look at that. Um, it doesn't really matter. Um, I mean, there is a North Carolina specific assault on a disabled person, criminal statute, that I guess could apply here. The police would really have to know that he was disabled for it to apply. Uh, that would be an element of the charge. Uh, but it doesn't matter because it's it's the severity of the offense for that criminal statute is no greater than for serious bodily injury assault, which obviously happened here, regardless. All right, let's see if there's any catch-up on the law of self-defense members questions. Doing a little refresh there. Uh, let's see. Yes, there's some more. Uh, people are talking in the chat about um, Wi-Fi cameras, cloud cameras, like the ring cameras versus wired cameras. I, I, I don't claim any expertise in this. I, I can tell you I've spoken with experts uh, and they recommend having a combination of the two. Uh, there, there, are, there are ways for bad guys to... Um, remotely disconnect your internet cameras from the internet. And then they're not recording to the cloud anymore. And for a lot of them, that's the only place they record. There's, there's no onboard or local storage. Uh, let's see. Uh, Law self-defense member Tax Pro Pam says, I would think any SWAT worth their salt would have surveyed the scene and had any occupied trailers in range evacuated in case of open fire. Uh, but the competence of this crew is questionable. Well, they had six hours to observe the scene and, and they were still acting like it was a hostage situation in the complete absence of any evidence consistent with the hostage situation. So it's just, it's the whole thing is uh, very odd to me. Let's see. Uh, Tax Pro Pam, Law South Defense member, says, I'm confused. I thought they were responding to a 911 call. Since when does responding to a 911 call for a shots fired require a warrant? No, they, they need the warrant to go into the house uh, in the absence of evidence of actual hostage situation, which if, if they heard screaming and stuff, uh, that would have been an exigent circumstance. They, they would have been privileged to just rush into the house, but they're they don't have any evidence of that, so they go to get a search warrant. What was the evidence for a search warrant? Just that phone call? <laughs> I think that's crazy. But judges hand out search warrants like crazy at the request of the cops these days. Uh, we, we don't have real probable cause uh, protections anymore. Uh, 
Uh, and I'll just refresh the super chat quick in case something new has come in and nothing has. So um, that looks like that looks like it, folks. Uh, this looks crazy to me. I think there's uh, good grounds for at least the officer who fired the first shots, uh, first shot, however many he fired, uh, to face criminal charges here. Uh, I think there's clearly a complete absence of transparency by the by the sheriff's office, the Cherokee County Sheriff's Department, uh, as well as the Cherokee um, Indian Police Department, as well as by the local district attorney who was supposedly consulted on this case, as well as the North Carolina Bureau of Investigation that was supposedly consulted on this case. Where's the transparency? Where's the explanation for why this guy was unnecessarily shot by the police? A lot seriously injured, miraculously not killed. And why, who's being held accountable for the disinformation, for the lies that appeared in that first press release that led to criminal charges against this guy who was unnecessarily shot? Who's being held accountable for that? There's zero accountability that I can see here. Zero transparency, even worse than no transparency, lies from the officers, from the departments involved. Um, so yeah, th this is the kind of situation in which I think like a state level intervention would be appropriate to figure out just what the heck is going on here. Um, and we'll see, obviously if news develops, I'll be sure to share it with all of you. Uh, very, very, very bad state of affairs here. Bad shoot folks. I, I'm based on what we see here, what we know so far and, and all this lack of transparency and the lies, you know, you've heard me talk about consciousness of guilt evidence before, right? Consciousness of guilt evidence is that you're involved in a shooting and then you engage in conduct after the shooting that suggests you have a consciousness of guilt. And that would include things like lying to the police. You don't have to talk to the police, but if you lie to the police, that's consciousness of guilt evidence. If you tamper with evidence consciousness of guilt evidence. If you flee the scene for purposes other than safety, consciousness of guilt evidence. And it can result in a consciousness of guilt jury instruction to the jury that essentially says, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this defendant's been accused of lying to the police, tampering with evidence, flight from the scene for purposes other than safety to avoid identification. If you believe those claims have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you are allowed to infer that not, not only does the prosecution think this defendant is guilty, the defendant thinks the defendant is guilty. That's a bad jury instruction, folks. Well, it applies here too. This lack of transparency, these lies, these ridiculous criminal charges, completely unfounded criminal charges against uh, Klopfer here, um, that suggests to me consciousness of guilt on the depart the part of the department. It's it's not good, folks. And uh, I hope I hope an adult steps into this and uh, starts uh, grabbing people by the neck and shaking them around and then figures out what's actually going on here and who ought to be held accountable for this. All right, folks. I think that's all I have to cover today. Um, I'm thinking tomorrow I might uh, do a uh, response video to the Derek Chauvin oral argument on appeal uh, that was made, I guess, last week it was made. It's about 45 minutes long. Um, we'll see if anything more interesting comes up in the news. But if nothing else comes up interesting, that's what I'll probably cover tomorrow. And tomorrow's show uh, is probably the Derek Chauvin uh, oral argument, which, which I, don't I don't expect to go anywhere, folks. But nevertheless, it was the oral argument that was made. Uh, so perhaps that will be of interest. Until then, remember, if you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill. That's why I carry a gun. So I'm hard to kill. So my family is hard to kill. Then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law. So you're hard to convict. Don't forget about our upcoming Law of Self-Defense Advanced class, Saturday, April 15th. This is our full day live class taught personally by me, streamed to you over Zoom. Uh, plenty of opportunity for Q&A. Uh, we cover all the elements of self-defense, defending yourself, defending others, defending property, uh, how to uh, interact with the police in the aftermath of a use of force event, six, seven hours of this stuff. Uh, and if you sign up for this course this month, and we only teach this class once, tw sometimes twice a year, um, the only one scheduled for this year so far is Saturday, April 15th. If you sign up for that class this month in January, it's 50% off. You save yourself $100. Sign up next month. In February, it's only 25% off. In March, it's only 10% off. In April, it's full price. 
So sign up sooner rather than later. Learn more about that class at lawselfdefense.com slash advanced. And that's also where you can sign up. All right, folks, until next time, I remain attorney Andrew Branca for Law Self-Defense. Stay safe. 